All right, good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I am here with our behavior analyst, and um, our presentation today is on the guidelines for the sexually aggressive and safety planning. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Just like in the past, when you guys have a question or a comment, make sure that you send the message through the chat box and when you're sending the message be sure to send it to the host so that we can see it. Um, as participants you all may not see the questions that are being sent but at the end of the presentation we will go through all the questions and try to answer them to the best of our abilities. If for some reason we can't get to all the questions by the end of our hour, we will pull the questions and come up with answers and send it back out to you guys just so that you all have that information. But um, any kind of any kind of question that you may have on this topic, feel free to send it and we'll do our best to get some answers for you. At this point, I just want to pass the presentation over to Dr. Coleman and he will take it away. Hello, thanks for joining us this morning. I'm Steve Coleman and I'm the agency senior behavior analyst. And I just want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, this topic has been on our minds for some time and we, we've done a lot of um, presentations across the state including uh, treatment presentations with some experts in the field. But no matter what we do, there's always uh, folks that we haven't gotten to. And at this juncture, it's pretty important that these four coordinators have a better knowledge of the guidelines and who sexually aggressive individuals are and how safety plans are developed. So I'm glad that you can join us today. The guidelines uh, really were the genesis of um, area behavior analysts expressing some concerns back at a time when we were as an agency a little more assertive about transitioning people from institutions and back into the community. And so this goes back now several years, but collaboratively we put together the guidelines and um, that evolved into uh, establishing uh, a way of communicating what was important for individuals. At the time, we really had no specific policy or guidance from the agency. And as people were receiving these individuals, uh, they were concerned on what expectations they needed to communicate to providers, uh, residential in particular, but also to behavior analysts in terms of uh, what would be appropriate and acceptable interventions for these folks. So we were attempting to be more planful, have a better understanding of what good practice was and uh, communicating appropriate interventions for these individuals rather than thinking that they were exactly like everybody else that they were serving. The guidelines, and you should have a copy of, and I should have mentioned this previously, you should have a copy of the guidelines, a copy of, or at least a blank form for the safety plan, and there was a text from the, the iBudget handbook, and you might not have the examples I'm going to show you of safety plans, but I'll show them on the screen and we can 
post those later on for, for you to have access to. Guidelines basically do a few fundamental things. It identifies who the population of individuals is that are considered sexually aggressive. Talks about a transition process, the way we thought it ought to be occurring. It, like anything else, it may be the things have evolved to something else in the local region. Uh, there's an overview of what a, the content of a safety plan should include and uh, does a pretty good uh, description of those elements of the plan. Uh, there's something in there for uh, what is expected of providers uh, as somebody comes under their care. Uh, talks about house rules that are house rules, not just for people living in the house, but people who work in the house so that um, everybody's on the same page. And then there's some pre general preventative measures that actually you may find helpful in terms of specifying the contents of this, this safety plan. Uh, you probably should know too that um, I think it was in the 2017 version of the uh, iBudget handbook that it specifically identifies um, the support coordinators as the lead person for the development of the support plan. The, uh, the process as people transition from a facility should include the creation or the completion of sexually maladaptive recipient characteristics. And actually, that document or form has been renamed. You, you have enhanced something that's called sexual misconduct characteristics, uh, or it's attachment HH. And it's, it's the same one, so I, it's not to confuse you, just to, to clarify. And it's the staff from the institution or the sending facility that should be completing this or it's the assigned behavior analyst in the community who should be completing this. Uh, one thing I should mention is that more than likely you will get these from uh, or for individuals who need safety plans, but some of them aren't specific to people needing safety plans. It's, they're also completed individuals with noteworthy appropriate sexual behavior. So we'll try to clarify that when we start talking about who the plan is for. But when the person is referred to the local area or region, there should be a collaborative team that gets together. The thought on this originally was that the area behavior analyst would probably be the first person to know about the referral and uh, then call everybody together. But given that the WSC is the lead, it's, it's more than likely if, if you get it, get the information first, that you will pull together um, a group of stakeholders that contribute to and or be informed about the person's behavior and preventive, me preventative measures that need to be taken to assure their safety and the safety of the community and their success in the community so that um, again, everybody's on the same page. Uh, the safety plan should be made, made available to all staff supporting the individual. And you'll hear me talk later about uh, most, in most cases, the uh, safety plan also has support from the behavior plan that behavior analysts will generate. The safety plan is a more telegraphic script of things that are reminders to everybody who serves that individual. Can I just remind everyone really quick to check your microphones, make sure you're all muted at this time. Thank you.
The, you'll see at the top of the, the guidelines, the guidelines of the four page document, that um, this is the fundamental definition of who the sexual individuals who are sexually aggressive, who those individuals are. And when we talk about sexual aggression, I mean, there's a, like any behavior, there's a continuum. <coughs> from a low end or low risk to high risk. In this case, when we say sexual aggression, we really mean sexual assault or sexual battery. In any case, uh, these are behaviors that are, are engaged where the person has contact with somebody for a non-consensual non sexual behavior. And, um, you know, many of these individuals never uh, see the police, are reported to the police, or go to court. So it's regardless of whether they've had police involvement or not, or court involvement, we're talking about individuals who have victims, meaning they've had some kind of physical contact with them of a sexual nature. The safety plan is intended to be part of the support plan. And I suspect that you all are working with the new form or format for the uh, person-centered support plan. And I'm looking at the document now. It happens to be that it's page eight, but it, depending on the printing, it, it may be somewhere else. But basically, you can find this issue to be addressed under personal rights. In the personal rights section, you'll see uh, a place to identify that a safety plan is required, and you respond yes if it is required, and then you would attach the safety plan that you've completed. In iConnect, if, if and when you are in iConnect, you'll find that within a selected resident or individual, that there's a tab for forms, and it will be in a drop down list of forms that you'll select from. You'll fill it out, and you'll learn that there's a way of attaching documents uh, to the support plan. Uh, so, in the actual support plan, there is a place that, that it fits. It's not the content for the support plan is not directly embodied in the, in the support plan at this time. The safety plan, um, you're responsible for the safety plan. Uh, it's likely to be developed with the support and consultation with the behavior analyst that's assigned to the case. Now, maybe this the scenario may be that you don't have a behavior analyst for the person just yet, and you can request, if needed, you can request consult from the area behavior analyst. But the, the assigned behavior analyst is the more logical person to go to because they're going to be developing a behavior plan that includes these target behaviors, and it would be good to pull them in early so that you both are saying the same thing in terms of the interventions and preventative measures. Um, each individual is likely to have a unique uh, aggregation of uh, problem behaviors and uh, circumstances that surround the occasion for these behaviors. And so there's, there's not and you don't want to take a cookie cutter approach to say restrictions or abridgments of rights or preventing people from going places just because you think it's that's the standard of practice. But it needs to be established based on the unique needs of the individual. And the intent of the plan is to support people being successful in the community as well as 
and that of course includes their safety and the safety of others. The safety plan, and you'll eventually get these slides. I, I, I don't want to read the slides, although it's very tempting. Um, the plan cover, it has a section, we're, we're going to actually look at it in a minute, has a section for historical information at the top, and that's the either bullet events that have occurred, or maybe to identify charges or arrests that the person's had. Uh, it's important to know the dates, particularly the date of the last event, so you have a better sense of the level of risk and how imminent it is that the person, or how frequently it is that the person uh, reoffends. So there's that, and then the the rest of the plan basically looks at triggers, grooming behavior, um, grooming behavior are those things that an individual does, maybe over weeks or years, with the individual, the potential victim, to get them to be comfortable with uh, the ultimate physical contact that's intended by the predator. The same is true for adults or pa parents or caregivers. They will deceive the, the adults to believe that they're trustworthy so that they can have access to the child or whoever the victim is. That's, that's what grooming is. And you'll see the definition, I believe, at the end of the document on the guidelines. There are also limitations to certain things in the community or to media, different types of media. We want to train people to engage in certain proactive or pro-social behaviors to avoid reoffending. Uh, it includes levels of supervision and whether or not special devices are needed to know where the person is at all times. There are also going to be likely to be interventions that may impact the individual's rights. If that is the case, then there must be a behavior plan or a part of a behavior plan that addresses the abridgment of rights and how how the person will have that right fully restored. And it's a plan that would require LRC oversight. Oops. So we'll quickly go through uh, the safety plan format. This doesn't look exactly like what you have in hand, but the content is, is going to be the same. So this was the summary I was telling you about. That, that, that is in the first box on your form. Then there's the special considerations that, that more specifically identify involvement with the court, what the order says, if they have to see a probation officer, you want to put in the detail of who that is, when that is, or how often, and what the contact number for that person is. Uh, the other thing may be that the person has, in fact, been designated as a sexual offender. And if that's the case, that's a, a formal adjudication that the person is a sex offender, and they will have to register locally with the sheriff's office. And it, in any case, if the person were to move, every time they move, they have to register with the local sheriff's department. So that's that section under the summary. And then there are a number of prompts, if you will, that ask mm -hmm. for triggers for specific situations that a um, person is likely to reoffend in or during. Um, you may find over time, particularly 
if there's not a lot written about the individual, you will learn and update the plans, identify grooming behaviors. Sometimes these folks are very helpful and friendly and want to give you gifts, et cetera, et cetera. And all those things, while they're, they, they're nice, they serve a singular, mostly serve a singular purpose for the sexual predator. And we talked about limitations on media, and you want to think of the full gamut of what media would include. Uh, everything from the electronically related stuff to uh, printed material. And um, you get surprises periodically when you discover that somebody has a pocket full of pictures of kids or little boys in underwear that they've torn out of magazines. So those are the kinds of things that lead you to update or identify for everybody's sake uh, the limitations on, on media. That and <clears throat> video games, computer, cell phones, they all have, they're all methods of taking pictures. And, um, and so there are times when those have to be uh, limited either by access or supervision or, you know, sometimes you can block certain, certain websites. And then there are also some things that we want to teach these individuals that we call avoidance behaviors. Um, they, they serve a preventative mechanism, uh, such as uh, you know, if you're in a risky situation at McDonald's and you're in line behind a kid, then maybe you need to go to the back of the line or you need to go stand with staff or engage your staff person who's supervising in conversation or what have you. And those are things that need to formally be trained so that the person knows how to respond in those situations. Oops. Uh, the level of supervision for these folks is important. Generally speaking, it's no less than line of sight. Uh, line of sight, at least indoors, and then in the community, it may be that it's more like a two to one, meaning you have somebody assigned to the person, but then with the other consumers that are out in the community, there's another, a second person who could serve backup. Um, and then the staff assignments, sometimes uh, the person is uh, drawn to specific types of, of individuals, specifically females, and has a behavior that at the very least is annoying or it could be dangerous. But sometimes it's not just sexual behavior, it could also be aggression or homicidal behavior on the part of, of some individuals. Then there's bedroom assignments. Uh, the uh, licensing rule 65G2, I believe, says that these individuals should have their own bedroom, although that can be adjusted with permission from the regional manager. So there, there are more than likely there are people who are um, sexually aggressive with roommates now, and that's probably okay, and that may very well be with good reason. The reason being, well, they're not interested in the roommate. They're interested in a kid that doesn't live in that home. So it, it's, it's all a matter of the circumstances and, and judgment on the part of everybody involved. There may be a need to identify limitations in terms of activities, um, places to avoid where potential victims would likely be or likely be at certain times of day or certain times of the year. Uh, it may even be that there are certain van routes that need to be taken in transporting the individual to, to go somewhere and um, the supervision that's required for those types of trips. 
you also need to be thinking about the day program and the work environment in terms of everything else that you put in the, the safety plan. You know, the example I gave you before of a person having a pocket full of pictures from magazines, there was somebody we ran across recently who um, they hadn't anticipated and, and was able to uh, have access to magazines with desired pictures at the ADT. So, you know, the ADT needed to be informed that that you need to, to pay more attention to that and to minimize or eliminate that, that access. And then there's the question of, uh, is this a person whose movement we need to know about? Do we need to uh, alarm the windows or the doors or have video um, to monitor the individual? And um, monitoring is permissible in homes through video, but um, the owner operator needs to get permission from the uh, regional operations manager. And it, it has to be used in primarily in in public spaces within the within the home. And then there's a section for additional notes. And uh, you'll see in a couple examples I'm going to show you um, the types of things that you might want to put in there. Stuff that either is precautionary or um, you know maybe is it, you know, there's certain monitoring that needs to occur to make sure the safety plan is followed, that kind of thing. So let's let's look at a um, a couple of examples of these safety plans. And I'm sorry we're holding questions to the end because there may be all kinds of things we want to ask, but Let's see if I can find Evan. There's Evan. Why don't we do this one first because it includes some samples of potential court related um, information. This individual had uh, engaged in a crime against a child, but it was not convicted, but there, there, the court did have some stipulations. And um, the, the twister here is the person is deaf, but apparently can communicate, and uh, apparently, well, you can't see it here, but they were able to read lips. The court order requires that the APD serve this individual. They didn't have pro a probation officer because there were no charges and they did not have to register. Under general precautions, you'll see here, uh, you wanna take particular care if the person needs to go to the bathroom, particularly um, out in public. And there's, I think there's some language in the guidelines that suggests how one manages the restrooms. And fundamentally, you don't send the person in to see if anybody else is in there. The supervising staff need to go in, make sure that there are no potential victims in there. Again, it's, it'll be unique to the individual. And um, they, the staff would need to um, check and then come out, have the person come in, and, take care of whatever, and the staff would stay there probably in the area of the sink if it's proximate to the stalls or what have you, and just make sure that nobody comes in and that the individual does come out the same door. Um, then it may be that um, staff need to be cautious about their relationship needing to maintain professional relationship, you know, maintaining respect and, you know, and uh, 
being conscious of the person's rights, but nevertheless being professional and being vigilant to make sure that um, they aren't being led down a path. And it's not like you want to tell some, no, I don't need your help. I mean, you can still let people be helpful, but just be cognizant that there may be a, a purpose behind that. Um, in this case, images of children, TV shows with kids, um, or maybe even going to movies that are oriented towards children, maybe they need to be avoided. In terms of avoidance behaviors to train, you know, we could use the scenario I already described that, that um, you know, you would be training him to, you know, wait till the staff goes in and checks the bathroom and then you'll go. Or if staff doesn't go with you, you need to say something to them. And we do have people like that who have told us, why did you put me in this home with all these kids in the neighborhood? So, you know, for the, the more functional individuals who are verbal, they they can learn and know what the right thing and the wrong thing to do is. And um, some of them are better than others at reminding us that they have a, an, a problem needs to be addressed. All right, and then um, the level of supervision. For the most part, it's line of sight for this person in high risk situations like going out to eat or shopping, somebody needs to be at arm's length. I mean, there's, there's more to shopping than what's in here. It may be that you wanna go shopping later, late in the day when kids aren't ordinarily supposed to be out grocery shopping, or it may be you wanna avoid the clothing stores at the time of year when families are getting new wardrobes for their kids. So it's all those kinds of things really need to be thought about. And if it's unique or specific to the individual, we want to add that in there in terms of supervision. Um, nothing real unique in that, but just the precaution there and the staff assignments. Risk sites or any place where the children are, you'll find too that in neighborhoods, um, some of for whatever reason, it seems like some of the some of the homes where these guys live, they're they're paying attention to when the bus arrives and picks up, and they're out there on the front steps uh, every day to be watching for for possible victims. So that means that they need to be occupied somewhere else in the house or go to a community activity or be at the ADT when kids are coming home from school, those kinds of things. Bedroom assignments, now I already sort of mentioned this, um, and they can be reassessed depending on who else lives in the home, depending on whether you got, you know, depending on the nature of the individual's interest in particular um, victims, it may be that you don't want to have them be in the same bedroom with somebody who's vulnerable, passive, and uh, otherwise, uh, a, a passive and willing victim, and maybe somebody who can't report being violated. Uh, this one, they have limitations on routes that go by schools and parks, and um, that could likely be the same scenario for a day program or work environment where you don't, while you do want folks 
employed, you might not want them employed in a park during a time when kids are playing in the park, for example. Uh, but there's lots of creative solutions to all these scenarios, and you just have to keep working the solution until you get the right fit. And uh, and then this one also has um, bed and window alarms to reduce risk of elopement uh, in order to offend. And this one had an additional note to not overreact, bearing in mind this person doesn't doesn't hear you, and they may not respond or be able to respond appropriately. For example, if you're prompting them to engage in an, in an appropriate avoidance behavior. Uh, they may not respond, may not respond appropriately. And, uh, you know, where you've got folks have been in a different environment, like a, one of our state facilities for a long time, they are used to other conditions, particularly the fact that there are pet, pedophilia if they engage in pedophilia, they've not had access, or they shouldn't have had access for the duration of time, how many, however many years that had been, they would not have had access to the victim. So that's Evan. So if there's anything about that one, if you have questions, I'll write them down and we'll take a look at them soon. We got one more. Ricardo. And this one's a little simpler. This is this one doesn't include uh, legal legal issues. A uh, person touches other folks and goes in their bedrooms at night. And this one is good about having a a date of a recent occurrence. No special considerations. Uh, the problem is during transitions from one activity to another when staff are distracted. Um, you know, this is a case where we, we don't really have any specific grooming behaviors, but if people are paying attention over time, they'll, they'll see precursor behaviors or grooming behaviors that suggest that um, the individual is, is trolling for victims. And then uh, want to avoid, you know, some shows amazingly are highly sexualized. You want to avoid those type of media uh, that would otherwise arouse the individual and be at a, least a setting condition where they might want to go and find a victim. Past victims, or in the case of avoidance training, um, here they're saying that they need to work with the individual to know to look away, to walk away, or go and stand by or engage staff that they're with. Generally speaking, it's line of sight supervision, arms reach uh, during transitions, and community activities. And that's really just the staff signing. And <clears throat> so that people don't uh, become fatigued by having to pay attention for too long, it's, it's a good practice to make sure that providers are rotating staff through. And sometimes <laughs> they are either reluctant or don't pay attention to that need of staff. And uh, I think it's important to write it down and and obligate them to, to do that. Some of this information you, you just don't know, or there is none. I mean, it's, it's certainly okay to put NA in a box, but 
again, it's a matter of staff being vigilant and to report uh, places where they've encountered, even informally, probes of uh, risk or poor risk of uh, victimization. The pop, they're recommending a single bedroom that's located closer to staff, um, near the bathroom, and away from other bedrooms. Or, you know, otherwise, it's probably, you know, if the person elopes, for example, it's probably better not to have their bedroom near the nearest exit, for example, and that they have to cross the location where staff are. Or that this is where maybe your alarms and monitors come in in hand. And then this one, um, line of sight for community trips and staff for sitting alone is, is the arrangement for this individual. And you may, may not know a potential victim or a past victim. But if you know a past victim, if they don't live with this person, uh, certainly you would like to know some characteristics of who the victims are, and that might be what you wind up putting in here in terms of people or types of people to avoid. And some of this you may not know until you or somebody uh, actually sees the environment. And I, I know that you have to make visits. So, you know, when you're <clears throat> visiting, if you're visiting a person at ADT or work or at home, you, you want to be paying attention to these kinds of things, particularly whether or not staff are, are uh, consistently implementing the plan as written and then reporting it if there's a problem so that it can be corrected. So those are two examples, sort of an easy one and a harder one. Um, but the bottom line here with this population, how are the notes on this? Crystal pie presentation. Oh, oh, that's right, we lost it. The important thing with this population is uh, the, 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 the disorder or the behavior problem is extremely intractable. People are really are, are not curable, but they are trainable. And so it obliges those people who are supervising to be constantly vigil um, and to main, maintain um, a professional relationship with these individuals. No less than line of sight is acceptable and you've got to know where and what the individual is doing at all times. Otherwise, as an advocate for your consumer, you're going to want to be sure that all the protections and plans are in place. You want to ensure that the person's successful in the community. I mean, we really can support and serve these folks in the community rather than institutionalizing them. We can teach them new behavior. We can reinforce them for appropriate adaptive behavior. Uh, and in all cases, the literature argues that reoffending is less likely if you do something. And doing something is better than nothing at all. So make sure that your plans are implemented when you make visits. Are staff and the provider following the safety plan? And does the plan need to be updated? So that pretty much is all I thought you needed to know today. Maybe at another time, we'll talk more specifically or more in depth about treatment for, for these individuals. So if you have questions, drop them in the chat box and send them to Elizabeth. And uh, I would tell you otherwise that if you have questions or concerns later on, you know, work with the assigned behavior analyst. Uh, if you don't have an assigned behavior analyst or you feel uncomfortable with what you heard from them, 
you always got your area behavior analyst to contact, and then you certainly are welcome to, to contact me, uh, and I'll give you my thoughts on whatever the, the issue is. So we're going to escape to your questions, eventually. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you want to do it? Yeah. Okay. Is there a way to broaden open that? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to just start from the first question that we got. Um, we have about 10 minutes, so that's a good amount of time to go through some of your questions. And as we go through this, if you guys have more, just keep sending them. Just in case. Okay. So, um, would it be appropriate to have in the safety plan a hurricane evacuation to a shelter, or is a shelter not appropriate for these individuals? Can I verbalize the answer to that? Yeah. I think that, that's a good question. Um, not that the person couldn't go to a shelter. Um, it would be what, under those circumstances, what would the plan for that person look like? Particularly supervision, uh, location within the shelter, uh, et cetera. Um, you know, in some cases, without without um, I'm trying to think of a, a way to say this, it, it may be better to have a separate shelter plan because the likelihood is is very low that they'll go to a shelter, but they might, depending on where you live in Florida. So I was thinking rather than overdoing the plan, at least have one good plan that, you know, if you had to modify it for as a shelter plan, you know, the, the environmental differences, which might be a little bit hard if you don't know exactly where the person is going. But, you know, the supervision needs to be high. I would think, you know, you would want that person in amongst their their own peers and the staff that are serving them. It's a good question. In regards to access to media, if an individual is a competent adult, how much authority does the WSC or direct service provider have to remove the individual from viewing the inappropriate content without a court order? Well, I would have to say that in the interest of safety in the community, that you have an obligation to um, work with the person to identify, make sure they understand what they should be looking at and what they shouldn't be looking at. But this is this is an abridgment abridgment of a of a right that needs to be in the behavior plan. And it, it has to be in the behavior plan so that you can explain or rationalize why there's an abridgment. Usually it's based on history and um, how it otherwise would contribute to the person uh, reoffending. In regards to implementing the safety plan, as a WSC, I understand we will need to fulfill our duties and complete this plan to include, to be included in the support plan. Since the safety plan will be included in the support plan, all service providers, all service providers for the individual will be aware of this. 
will uh, probably will also provide you with that. Well, I guess I'd have to say I think they need to be aware of it. Um, you know, they're under the umbrella, HIPAA umbrella for that person, so they they need to know about this person. They need to know if they're personally at risk and how to respond appropriately. Um, and if they actually go out in the community, let's say, with um, with somebody, another type of provider other than their own direct care staff, that person needs to understand what the limitations on the consumer's access to certain locations would be. And I would think that that would be coordinated with the staff in, in the home, if not the behavior analyst. Will the WFC have any legal protection in in case the family decides to go after the WFC for tarnishing the individual's image with current providers? Will the family have any legal protection in case the family decides to go after the WFC for tarnishing the individual's image with all the current providers? Well, I'm not an attorney, but I would say that um, we all have protection as providers if we follow, you know, the rules and instructions that that we've been given by the agency. The agency adopted these guidelines, and um, they were signed off by all the managers and we agreed that this was something that we needed to do. So it's, I mean, we can't, we can't deny the, the facts as they exist and it's really to protect the individual and to protect the community. That's our obligation. Could you explain grooming behavior? If you look at um, the guidelines, I think it's on page four, there's a definition there. And in this context, we're not talking about brushing your teeth and combing your hair. It refers to the process that a sexual predator may engage in with a potential victim over a period of months or even years to break down a child or victim's defenses and increase the chance that the individual will accept physical touch and become vulnerable to sexual abuse without discovery. This process may include behavior of the sexual predator that serves to persuade or convince or otherwise deceive the parents or adults that they're trustworthy with their children. So I, I would otherwise I would offer that Google it. That's a common place for folks to go out and get the in, any information about any question. But it's basically the person builds a relationship so that they're trusted, and um, you know there, there's there's like six steps that I may not remember, but for these individuals, there's a stepwise process. But really, it's a behavioral shaping process that they identify a target, and then little by little, you know, they befriend the person, they give them gifts, they become trusted, and then through accidental touch, it becomes more evasive, invasive over time. And actually, they um, actually teach the victim that they were at fault or make them feel that they were at fault. Um, and uh, be embarrassed or feel guilty and not want to report that they were victimized, either because of embarrassment or because how they will be thought of by 
adults, family members, you know, whoever, you know, has a, a responsible status in their environment. I hope that helps, but there's, there's plenty of information out there on the internet. Do we have to release a copy of the safety plan when releasing the support plan to all providers, even if they will not be affected by the behavior? I would only release it to the providers that are going to be part of those scenarios where supervision is required either whether it's in the home or um, out in the community. I mean, those are those are the types of providers for sure. You wouldn't want to give it to some of the consumable medical people, or mm -hmm. yeah. I, I mean, I certainly people at the ADT, or at least a responsible person at the ADT, needs mm -hmm. to know about it. They don't have to necessarily share the document, but they may instruct staff in the critical few elements that are relevant to the ADP. My concern is when there are couples that decide to become intimate, kissing, etc., and one of the parties decides to inform the staff of such affection. As a WSB, is it within our discretion not to report it as sexual aggression, even if the other provider has already called DCF and reported sexual abuse? Because some staff do not want to be liable for not reporting, even though we may identify it as being as being in relation due to history. Well, there there are really at least two things that need to be taken into consideration, and that is the age of the participants and the ability to get consent. Um, if it's apparent that the person, you know, the person on the receiving end is is um, not age of consent, or if the person on the receiving end is not competent, even if they, I would have to say, even if they are not adjudicated incompetent, then um, it's it's their business, their own business. But, but those are the two things: it's age and competence to 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 get consent. That's up to you. Okay, it looks like we have a couple more questions. I don't think we're going to be able to get to them since we are at about one minute up before our time is up. So I will get these questions to Dr. Pullman. We will work out some written answers, and um, when they're ready to go, I'll send it out to everyone. Um, as for the rest of the day today in about five minutes you guys will get an automated email from webex and that will have the link to your assessment once you complete the assessment with a score of four or higher you will receive your one credit for this training session if you receive a score of three or lower you will not receive your credit um, so make sure you take your time with those questions and um, try to do your best. If you have any questions, um, oh, I did see that some people were looking for the materials. All of the materials that were presented today will be posted on the Support Coordination website, um, the same place where I post all of the advisories. Um, the call, the actual training is going to, is recorded as well, and so that recording will be up on the website probably tomorrow. Um, so just check back there. If for some reason you have a hard time finding the info, I will just email me and I'll send it to you. It's no big deal.
Um, but just give me a little bit of time to get it all up on the website. If there are no other questions, we are going to sign off for the day. So thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful day.